All right, so today we are comparing two really cool cameras, both no doubt gonna be very hot cameras. They're both in the same price range, right around $11,000. Actually, I think the Sony is literally $1 cheaper. So if you're trying to save that cash, Sony takes the win there. They both have very similar features, but they're also very different. The Canon has that 4K Super 35 dual gain output. And of course we have the full frame, 6K down sampled into a 4K image. Now we're losing the light real fast, so let's strike these up. Here we go, we have mystery camera A, mystery camera B. Can you guys guess which one's which? Now. We ended up losing all the lights setting up this shot, so we're at ISO 4000. Now, both of these cameras, plenty good enough to get professional looking images, like the type of images you would see on Storyblocks, who happens to be our sponsor today. All right, guys, come on. Yay! Woo, yeah, we yeah, love Storyblocks. You're the Thank best. You. <laughs> You're my favorite blocks. <laughs> Storyblocks is the place to go and get your stock footage, but not only that, they have audio, and whenever I go, hey, follow me on Instagram. See that little graphic that comes up? I got them from Storyblocks. It's a little After Effects template. All I had to do was go and type in my Instagram handle and look at that, fancy production value, baby. <laughs> Since we're losing all the light, let's just cut to some beautiful images that we found on Storyblocks. These are all images that you can use in your own videos. Pretty much all your video needs, they got you covered right there. I definitely recommend checking out the unlimited plan, unlimited downloads with just one account. Count. How big is this library? Elephant size. What's bigger than an elephant? A whale, Gene. A whale, a whale, yes. What else? An airplane. An airplane. Oh, what are those balloon shaped things? A, a blimp, yes. How about some Grand Canyon action? Go to storyblocks.com forward slash potato jet. Grand Canyon. Done. Do they have aerial photography? Hey, guys, guys, guys calm down. The Storyblock sponsorship isn't supposed to be this long, okay? I already said what I need to say. Now you guys are just dragging it along now. But Gene, I'm hungry. I just want to see some like really nice ice cream. That actually sounds great. Some Food? tacos. Some tacos. All these stock clips found right there on Storyblock. So don't forget to hit that link in the description. And we need to do a giveaway. What is the giveaway? I haven't thought that far ahead. We have a lot of drones, so let's give away our Mavic Air. Yeah? We'll all sign it with love. Well, unless you don't want us to sign it, then we won't sign it. Just let us know if you want it signed or not. <laughs> All you gotta do for a chance to win, drop a comment down below within the first five and a half hours of this video going live, and somewhere in that comment, just put a semicolon in there. Yeah, there, there you go. All right, so now that we're back in the studio, let's take a closer look at some of this footage side by side. So are you ready for the results? Camera A on the left is the C300 Mark III. Camera B on the right, FX9. Now both of these cameras were shooting at ISO 4000 T 1.5. It was really dark there, but I'm gonna go ahead and digitally boost both of their exposures. And the FX9 definitely looks cleaner. There's more information, it's better. So the FX9 takes the win for low light. And that's no surprise since the FX9 has a dual base ISO at 800 and 4000. I was able to just switch it to that high sensitivity mode. And there you go. Moving on to the next shot here is where the Canon C300's dual gain output sensor is really going to shine. We should in theory get more dynamic range, so we should be able to look into the shadows, get more information out of there, and also the highlights as well. Now definitely keep in mind that the dual gain output sensor, or DGO, is completely different from dual gain sensors that are a lot more common. For example, on the FX9, I can switch the base ISO between 800 and 4000. But on a dual gain output sensor, like on the C300, there's two circuits connected to the sensor and one records the highlights, make sure there's a lot of saturation in there. And the other circuit records the shadow separately, giving it less noise and then combines it. So both circuits are being used at the same time on a dual gain output sensor. And the benefit of doing all that is that this camera has more dynamic range than any other camera Canon has ever offered and claims 16 stops. And that usually comes into play when you're dealing with some intense natural light. You don't have to be as selective of your environment or time of day. So that is a big plus. Now let's take a look at the shot of Sam where he's getting blasted by direct sunlight. The background is all in the shadows. They're both on native ISOs and I'm gonna go ahead and overexpose the shot by opening up the lens by three stops. But luckily both of these cameras are powerful enough to rip cover this image. But if we do look closely at the C300 Mark III, we're getting a little bit of clipping in those skin tones. And then we take it another step, go five stops over, they're both goners. But again, the FX9 seems to be able to handle the highlights a little bit better. So the FX9 is looking great until we start going underexposed. This is two stops under, and
and we correct it and you already see how much the detail in the background in the shade is already gone let's just keep it going four stops under and when we try to correct this the sony gets destroyed so this is telling me that canon is giving me a ton more information in the shadows the sony giving me a little bit more information in the highlights i actually noticed something similar with the canon r5 and the a7s3 i don't think it'll be a bad idea to underexpose the canons by a little bit but there is more to the story see i'm recording at the highest possible setting on both of these cameras which means the canon has an advantage because it can record raw internally i do love the raw light codec that's in here it's easy to work with but it is a gigabit per second you're gonna blast through 500 gigs of data in an hour of recording so you cannot be trigger happy in this mode but do we still have access to all that dynamic range in xf avc and the answer is not really we can still recover the highlights by a comparable amount this shot was three stops over still looks okay but we look into the shadows this shot is four stops under and it's still better than the fx9 but when you compare it to the raw it's not even close this is five stops under and really the raw was the only one that really stood a chance down here so when it comes to dynamic range the canon still does win even in xf avc but to really unlock all that potential you really have to shoot raw the biggest difference between these two is probably sensor size with the fx9 we get that full frame sensor so we have a wider field of view so both of these cameras have the same exact lens on it the 16 to 35 f4 and it's so much wider on the fx9 so on the fx9 we're gonna have to zoom in that lens to try to match that c300 but also keep in mind that super 35 sensors aren't all the same size the sensor on here is definitely one of the biggest sizes that fall under the super 35 category so if it's the shallow depth of field you're after you can still get it with the c300 mark three i'm on youtube hey. yeah! <laughs> are you a sony shooter or a canon shooter i have a t6i he has a 60 mark, mark ii but my, my, my goal is to get the, the new Sony. Yeah, Keep right. up the good work, right, guys. <laughs> now let's take a look at sharpness. Usually I try to do these with the same exact lens, but since they have different sensor sizes, that's a little bit difficult, but they're both on Sigma Cine Primes. They're both sharp, but once we punch in about 500%, it does look like the Sony does have that sharpness advantage, which isn't really a surprise because it does downscale a 6K image. So then we get even closer to a thousand percent and they're both good, but the Sony definitely has that edge. Steve, which one of these cameras do you like better? The one you're shooting on because it's easiest to carry. <laughs> but you probably like the FX9 because when clients see this camera, they go, oh yeah, that's nice and big. Well, I can bill more for this. So it does have its advantages. For sure. <laughs> but on the other hand, Sam's always following me around and I'm assuming you like the lighter, smaller camera. It's so compact that if you go down low, I could go all the way almost to the floor. If you go high, I could go high. It's easy for me to follow you because it's small and I'm just so familiar with the Canon system. Like I feel like when you you look at it it's very easy to figure out what each button does like this whole half is very self-explanatory magnification peaking zebra waveform monitor shutter i still gain light right and then you look over here your first time shooting on it it just takes a little bit more like what's that do pressing it trying that how about this what's that do you know it takes a little bit more guesswork opposed to here where everything's labeled clearly but you still have the option to go in and customize everything i think canon across the board has the most user-friendly interfaces from the lower end cameras all the way up to the higher end cameras another aspect of the c300 Mark three is the monitor's a little bigger than the FX9. This monitor up here is a little bit weird at first, but once you get used to it, it's actually pretty nice because you know exactly how to place it and you can very quickly get it in between the different positions. Now, one thing I do like is that this is a monitor slash viewfinder, but this part itself, how many times has it fallen on us while we were out shooting? It's weird when it doesn't fall on us. It's just too easy for it to just come undone like this. This latch is a little bit too light. At least this thing's been durable so far. Now the C300 Mark III, we have up to 10 stops of ND, which is great. So higher range, but every time you adjust the ND, you're gonna see some plates move in and out. One of my favorite things about this FX9 is this new electronic ND variable. And remember, it's not like those those typical variable NDs where you rotate and it can kind of mess with your image because there are polarizers in there. It's electronic. Some electric current goes through it and blah, 
blah, blah, blah, some science stuff. And it's a very nice, consistent, even level of neutral density. You do see that plate come in as you turn it on, which is at two stops. And then you can scroll it very gradually all the way up to seven stops. I think a lot of times you're gonna be floating in between that two to seven stop ND range. So in those cases, it's nice to have this electronic variable. But I think if you shoot in bright daylight with really fast lenses, you might want that extended range of neutral density. So we're talking about being able to hit an F1.4 on a nice bright sunny day and having enough neutral density in the camera to handle that. And having a camera that auto exposes your shot using an ND filter, what? This was a first for me at least. No, I don't think anybody else does. I was thinking about that. I don't yeah, think it's crazy, else right? Else Usually you stay away from auto exposure, right? right? But if you have to, your f-stop, your ISO, your shutter speed, all that stays locked. Your auto exposure comes from that ND, which is freaking awesome. Oh, 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 oh man, we were just talking about how this thing never broke. Oh my God, Steve just broke it. Right? Well, I guess we found out that it's durable until Steve touches it. Sam, didn't we say we weren't going to let Steve touch the cameras? I don't know who invited him. I know, right? Look at that guy. You wish you didn't invite me. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of do now. <laughs> Could have easily stayed home today. Yeah, right, Steve. You love us too much. I also like dental work. While Steve's focusing on trying to fix this thing, let's take a look at the FX9 real quick because I do like how it feels as a handheld cam. For long shoots, I probably want this one. Yeah, especially if you're doing handheld. Because with this, I have a dovetail handheld rig that I might slide this onto sometimes. But a lot of times I do just end up finding myself just pressing that battery up against my upper part of my chest and holding it this way, which tends to be stable, but it does get a little bit tiring because all the weight is in front of you, opposed to the FX9, where majority of the weight can sit right there on your shoulder, nice and comfortable. And then you have your telescoping handle that you can use to hit your record button and your general controls. Now, when it comes to stabilization, C300, much smaller, meaning it's a lot easier to get onto many different types of gimbals. And you might actually be surprised at how many gimbals can accept the C300 Mark III. Those options definitely get a lot slimmer with this FX9. Even when you strip it down, you're still left with this pretty long body. So you have to make sure you have a gimbal that can support that. Now with the C300, I often like to run a stabilized lens and also there's a layer of digital stabilization that's built into the camera which is nice it definitely helps a majority of the time but just like a majority of other Canon cameras if you're in a tight close-up of something then it might track that subject itself and actually give you the reverse effect by making the camera look like it's shaking when it's really not on the other hand you have the FX9 where you can use an optically stabilized lens of course but also you can turn that off and store the gyro information on the camera itself so that in post you use catalyst browse and that software is actually incredibly good at stabilizing your footage and what's amazing is that you can decide exactly how much stabilization you want it to use in post so you don't have to lock anything in now it doesn't get rid of motion blur so they do recommend using a faster shutter speed maybe like one one hundredth of a second is what they were recommending but it is impressive and i love the idea of storing all that gyro information in the metadata of the file it's kind of like the same thing that gopro has been doing right but the downside of that is that you can't use both an optically stabilized lens and the metadata at the same time what's also nice about using the gyro information is that it processes that footage way faster like if you're using something like warp stabilizer that takes an eternity right but when it's using the gyro data it just takes a few seconds to load up and it's really fast it shows you the side by side of non-stabilized and stabilized and you can really dial in the exact amount of stabilization you want so i love that feature i think it's super cool now when it comes to slow motion the c300 mark III definitely takes the win because we could do 4k 120 and still use dual pixel autofocus while in 120 raw even i love having that capability I can also go into 180 frames per second in 2K, but there's gonna be a crop. But the FX9, that kind of lacks a little bit in slow-mo. There's supposed to be a firmware update coming out in October that's gonna unlock a few feature, but it's still nothing crazy. 4K 60, and I think there's gonna be a slight crop. Won't be able to do 4K 120, no autofocus in any of the slow-mo modes, and 180 frames per second in HD. So 4K 120, 4K 60. All right, so let's wrap this up. Both of these cameras, really capable. They're both awesome 
awesome. But me personally, with my style of shooting, I would personally go for the C300 Mark III. There's two things that really sold me on this camera. One is its compact size and portability. That's really important to me. And two, being able to shoot 4K 120 while maintaining that dual pixel autofocus. That is such a nice feature for me. It's also very simple and easy to figure out how to use. So I could hand it off to Sam or Steve or anyone that hasn't really used this camera that much and they'll still be able to easily figure it out right away. I could even hand this to Carrie and say, hey, just put the camera at me and it'll probably turn out looking pretty good. I also like the stabilization options, especially when you put on a stabilized lens and also turn on the digital image stabilization. Like I said, that digital stabilization isn't perfect, but it's also very convenient being able to get some pretty smooth footage just right out of the camera. And when I am on a job and I want the best image out of here, I love that internally I could get 12 bit raw out of there, but even just that 10 bit XF AVC is pretty awesome. And at that point, I might pull off this EF mount, slap on a PL, I'll fit it with some bigger lenses and you could really rig this out to become a proper cinema camera. Not to mention the built in anamorphic modes and also these CFast Express Type B cards crazy fast. What is this? A 1700 megabyte per second read speed. You can fill up this 512 gig memory card and download it onto a laptop like that it's awesome and also the ability to go all the way up to 10 stops of neutral density so even in bright daylight i can go shoot at an f14 if i want to but again that is for my style of shooting but i was just talking to my buddy chris and i recommended he get the fx9 for his style of shooting one because he's all about that full frame life but also you have the option to go super 35 mode on here and you still have enough resolution on that sensor to get a 4k image so you're flexible on full frame or super 35 and also portability isn't as big of a factor for him a lot of times for his projects he'll drive up to a set and then shoot there all day and then load back out he's not really going to be packing it into a backpack and go hiking or anything like that but he does also have an a7s3 on pre-order so when that comes in that would be the perfect hiking camera and then he can have this that will match fairly decently with the a7s3 now of course that means he has a collection of e-mount lenses which is great because so is this camera right because on the c300 mark iii these are all ef mount lenses and if you also so pair that with you know like the r5 then you're gonna have rf lenses so a lot of times you're gonna have to decide are you gonna get an rf lens or an ef lens right but with e-mount it's the same across the board so you buy one great lens and it'll fit just as well on this as it will on the mirrorless camera and internally it may not have raw but it does have that 10 bit codec which is generally enough for a majority of professional shoots but you also have the option to eventually output 16 bit raw out of this camera so when you hook it up to the right devices, it's going to be a monster. And this electronic variable ND, love this thing. And even though it does cap out at seven stops, generally that's plenty. Even if it's a really bright sunny day, you can still open up your lenses to f2.8 in most cases. I also love that the gyro data gets stored on the file so we can stabilize the shots in post. And even though all these buttons may not seem super intuitive, you can go ahead and customize it exactly how you want it. So if it's your camera and you're using it day in day out you're going to be able to memorize all these buttons real easily and customize it exactly how you want it and even though the screen is slightly smaller i do like the option of being able to pop it into evf mode yes we fixed it by the way if you're shooting in bright daylight it's definitely much more pleasant to look through a viewfinder than a monitor no matter how bright that monitor is and also on the next firmware update they're going to enable touchscreen operation up here so that's going to be nice navigating through the menu that way and maybe one of the biggest benefits is that it's also a full dollar cheaper than the C300 Mark III. And if you want to go full frame, then it's like, what, $5,000 less than the C500 Mark II? So that's a lot of dollars. But they're both really, really feature heavy. They're powerful. They're convenient. They're smart. So you're really not going to go wrong with either of these. To wrap this up by reading a few comments from my last video. So I did a giveaway in the last video and everybody is commenting entry done entry done reason everyone is commenting like that what why is everybody saying that i must be missing something because i just said drop a comment down below and then everybody is saying entry done i don't see a single comment that doesn't just say entry done what the heck is happening seriously though i've been scrolling for a minute now and it's every single 
<laughs> I can't wait to read all the comments down below and just see a whole bunch of semicolons. Anyways, let's call it a wrap for this one. See you guys on the next one. See ya. See you guys on the next one. See ya. There's too many see ya.